I begin with a story because I think this story beautifully encapsulates both Jesus' words at the end of this gospel lesson and that marvelously weird and uh, bewildering story from the second lesson, the harrowing of hell. You might remember that phrase. What we say in the creed, Jesus not only died, but in between his death and resurrection, he descended where? Yes, to the dead is how we say it now. We used to say when I was a kid, he descended into hell. And that story has always captured my imagination, my wonderment. And all these years, I went to seminary to learn in part what that meant. <laughs> Not the only reason. And didn't get a full answer. And all these years, haven't got a full answer for it and never will. But there's something really powerful about it. So here's the story. And I got this from one of my pastors back in Minnesota. He had a family in his congregation with the cutest little girl like these girls up here uh, who had a hearing problem. And the hearing problem got so bad she had to have a cochlear implant at a very vulnerable age. And she knew she wasn't going to be like the other kids in school. And she knew she had some good friends that would not belittle her, but she also knew, as girls know very well in middle school, there can be some snarks in the mix. And she was afraid. Now, her daddy loved her dearly. And this pastor was telling me, one day he came to church and he looked completely different. Because he shaved his head completely. And I mean no nubbins or anything, just skin. And he went to a tattoo artist. And he said, put a cochlear implant on my head. Only make it four times the size of what it normally is on a kid. And so I, I'm not kidding. I've seen a picture of it. So there's a front piece that goes right here. It's small on the girl. It's big on him. And then there's a processor back here. It goes around like that, but it's big on him. So people can see it from 35 feet away when he's at church when he's at a board meeting, when he's at work, when they're on vacation. Oh, and that isn't all. Then he has, some of you know, a cochlear implant. There's a wire that goes up to a spot up here. And then there is the processor. Huge. So that he could what? Demonstrate he loved his girl. And he could demonstrate he was going to walk with her in whatever life would bring. And that was a sign daily to this little girl who said, Daddy, I love you. I know, and as she grew older, I know what love means. It means doing something because you love someone. Okay. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent, metanoia in Greek, and beloved the gospel. Now you're saying... Uh, Pastor, you, you need to get new glasses. It does say, uh, repent and believe the good news. But I'm going to make an argument here, and I will in the forum, that that word is almost impossible to use in Christian faith now because of the cultural understandings of what believe has come to mean and what it meant in ancient times and in the Bible. Uh, repent is metanoia, meta beyond. Nomos is the mind. Repentance means go beyond the mind that you currently have into something new that God is presenting. Okay, now in it's Lent. And we rightly think of the word repent as feeling sorry for our sins. That's right. We should feel sorry for our sins. And that's what repentance has been featured as. You know, really feeling badly for our sins. But, the word, but that is a later feature. The original Greek word simply went, go beyond the mind, whatever it is right now, your ideology, your philosophy, into something that God is going to show you. Go beyond mind, your current mindset, see. Um, the early disciples, they needed to learn this. You remember the stories. 
most, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think most of the people uh, in Christianity today and in the early days of the Old Testament, uh, it, if they didn't fully embrace, they partially embraced the idea that God wasn't fully loving. Oh, he loved us, but only when we did good. When we were good little boys and girls, and then when we didn't, he wasn't just angry. He's very willing to send people to hell. Lots of people believe this today. Um, it should, I hope it sounds really sad to you that people believe this, but they do. And Jesus came along and he said, I, I'm bringing you good news. Metanoia, disciples, you 12, you 30, you 50, you 100, they, because they grew, you know, uh, more people as time went on. Go beyond the mindset that you've had. He's, in, in effect, I think he would have said, I know that uh, our scriptures and our leaders are full of this tyrant of heaven. But God is not like that. And if he knew this story, he would have said, God is like that dad that shaved his head for the sake of his girl. Why? Because Jesus came to show us what God was really like and to take to task some of the stuff that was not true about God, but very natural to think about God. And we all know it, and we all have a little piece of that too. Um, Jesus came to look like us, like the dad did for his daughter. Jesus came to be vulnerable, like she would be in her classroom with her cochlear implant. God came to love the whole world with a love that everybody could see. Everybody in that church community, in that little town, when they saw this dad, they were reminded, right? How could you not be reminded of this sign? And you didn't need a sermon about it. You knew it was a small town. His daughter's got a cochlear implant, and he's got one too, only it's much bigger. What does that tell you? What does that do to your heart, see? That's what Jesus is saying. He, he, he becomes 30 years old. He starts his ministry. He's sent out into the wilderness to think about everything he's supposed to do to be tempted. And he comes out saying, repent, metanoia. Go beyond what you have heard in the past. Something new, which really isn't new, but he was correcting the old theologies, see, the tyrant of heaven. No, Jesus talked about the father, the daddy, the Abba, he called Father God. He called uh, God Abba, Daddy. See, he, he talked about things in the Old Testament. He said, well, I know you've heard this said, but I tell you this. He was correcting them as he's doing here. Um, and he came to take on all our iniquities, all our flaws, all our troubles, all our sorrows, all the words we said that we can't take back, he took them. All the deeds we wish we wouldn't have done, he took them in himself, see. This is what it means to praise Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the cosmic Christ, or as I used to tell my confirmands, who did Jesus die for? The whole world, pastor, why? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, see. That's what Jesus was coming to show us. And uh, Luther, it, it, with all his both strengths and weaknesses, part of his strength was this thing called sin boldly. You've heard this. Uh, what he meant by this, and it's referenced in the second lesson, in this harrowing of hell, is baptism is really important because it is the sign and the action in you that gives you a clear conscience even though you are a sinner and tomorrow you will go ahead and say something rotten about somebody else. Luther knew all this because he was so doggone honest and he said, go ahead, Christian, you can have a clear conscience because you are baptized. And you know the stories about when he really was struggling, um, he would say, I am baptized. Not I was baptized, I am baptized. I have a clear conscience that even though I sin, I can go right out and enjoy life and I can go out and serve Christ and serve my neighbor. Sin boldly, Christian, he said. It was his way of reminding us, you ain't perfect, but that shouldn't stop you from living like Jesus. 
Oh, no. I just have to read this again because... All right, 1 Peter. By the way, there are eight passages in the Bible that speak about this Jesus announcing to Satan, to the evil spirits, to anyone in the realm of the dead, uh, it's all over. I have taken the sins of the world. Uh, This is the victory of God over not just sin and evil, but over the prisons that you belong in, see? Uh, Christ suffered for sins once for all, it says. I have it, big circles around the word all here. The righteous for the unrighteous. In order to bring you, plural, everyone, to God. Everyone. In which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. You know, the Old Testament has these uh, ideas. You could call it Hades. You could call it Sheol. Uh, the Greek word that was actually used in this one is Tartarus. It's a Greek understanding of where bad spirits go and are kept underground. Uh, it's often called hell. Um, he went down and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. In this case, those in the days of Noah who were eating and drinking and doing all kinds of bad stuff. And that is the time <laughs> Paul says, you know, it was like being saved through the water when God saved the people through the flood and baptism is like it. You know, it's, uh, it's prefigured by the flood and it now saves you, makes you whole. Or as Uther would say, gives me a clear conscience that even though I sin, I can continue on in life, enjoying it, and I can continue loving other people as an appeal for God to a good conscience. All right, speaking of prisons, this one was near the end of my time as bishop. I won't go through the whole story, but I'll tell you this. There was a congregation in North Dakota, Mandan, North Dakota. No one's been there. It's near Bismarck. Heart River Lutheran Church. It celebrated like a 100-year anniversary and so on. And um, They were in a position like we are here at Agnew's Day. They were looking for a new pastor. They were doing a ministry site profile. <laughs> Those of you that have did all that work, you know what that is. It's worth doing. You've got to do it. You know. And uh, what is the mission now? After 100 years, what, what's the mission now? And at one of the important congregational meetings... A woman stood up and said, you know, we've been doing all this work on the mission site profile, and what is our mission? I want to make a a statement. And it was really quiet, because she didn't speak very often. And she said, we here at Heart River Lutheran Church are within sight of the boys' prison in Mandan. And this was a strong lady. And she said, why aren't we over there talking with them? And she brought up Matthew 25. I was in prison, and you what? Visited me. She got through talking about, she said, all this other stuff, I'm glad we have Ludafisk. She said, but what's the mission that God wants us into? Ludafisk? Or with those boys. These are teenage boys that have broken in and stole money and broken in and stole cars. And and not major things, but they were in this correctional facility, see? The uh, uh, Mandan Correctional Facility. Then this man gets up and he said, I second what Gladys said, let's have a vote. (laughs) And uh, people were like, no, just wait a minute. And he said, and furthermore, I think we should move our worship into the penitentiary. And someone said, it's a correctional facility, it's not a penitentiary. All the more reason, it's easier to get in, he said. (laughs) And you know what they did? They did that. They kept their church building, but all their worship was in a little chapel that they rented. No twisting of arms. They just said to the boys, Ah, you're welcome here. We have some nice people. We have good goodies afterwards. Bismarck's, you know, and heavy donuts and coffee and lots of punch. Uh, You don't have to come, but, you know, but they left the door open. during worship so that the sounds of joyful hymns could be heard by these boys in big trouble. See? And some of them started coming. And after the, after the toughest kid came, they all came. <laughs> and they were befriended by Gail and Travis and Jennifer and Ralph and the lady that started this whole thing. And they realized, 
I can have a second chance. I can have a new life. And that developed into an ecumenical ministry. So the Baptists got involved, the Presbyterians, the Catholics, and then it became interfaith. <laughs> and they had a secondary ministry, which was they, they appointed mentors who were naturally working with the boys. And this eventually became girls as well, boys and girls. And girls can do nasty things too on occasion. <laughs> and uh, they said the second part of our ministry is to go out after they're released and continue to befriend them. And they go down to the big city of Sioux Falls or somewhere and they kept track of them with their iPhones. And they would say, how you doing? Are you keeping out of trouble? You know I love you. <laughs> Follow up. Agape love is love that is more than emotion. As we were saying a couple weeks ago, compassion means to suffer with another human being. And isn't this what Jesus is doing to those in prison underneath the ground in Hades, Tartarus, hell, whatever you want to call it? Now, my, my, uh, some of my friends who are more in the neo-evangelical realm, they have reminded me, and I've said this, they said, well, he didn't go down there to release them and, and bring them home to heaven. He went down there to say he's the victor over Satan. And I thought, like Jesus is some kind of a spiritual rock star that has to go down and say, I need all the applause I can get. I did all this. Or is Jesus not the one who loves every soul ever created? My intern pastor had this, uh, this saying, and it's, I can never forget it. At the end of time, little story, at the end of time, at the supper of the Lamb, Jesus comes out with the hors d'oeuvres and the scotch, and as he's standing there inviting everybody, smiling, he says, wait, before anybody takes a bite, he said, we're not all here. We're not all here. Jesus, the disciples said, this is the supper of the Lamb. It's got to start, he said. It doesn't start until Judas gets here. Now, wonderfully, scandalous, mind-boggling, bewildering, confusing, let it all be in your heart. Because there are verses that don't talk that way. You know, it's all there in the scripture. There's a wonderful uh, collection of different theologies and authors. But for my money, Jesus doesn't go down there just to be a big shot and say, look what I've done. Look at my muscles. He went down there to say, come home. It's all over. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not yet come. Repent and believe in the gospel today.